So <laughs> now we are going, uh, Susanna, you'll have to help me with your uh, surname. Okay, it's Kołodziejska Smagawa. Okay. So <laughs> even though I'm from a Polish origin, I hardly talk any Polish. So, uh, Susanna from Warsaw uh, will talk to us about the reflection of the female body in the Polish Jewish ego documents of the late 19th and early 20th century challenges and opportunities. Please. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to this um, very interesting workshop. Um, I'm also not a historian really because I'm a philologist, a Polish and English one, uh, but for many years uh, I've been researching uh, Jewish culture and Jewish history through these Polish uh, and Jewish relations. Uh, my PhD was about uh, Polish Jewish Weekly Israelita. Mm -hmm. And then I had a project, I was leading a project about <coughs> Polish Jewish literature between uh, 1860 and 1918. And this project really led me to uh, my current project, <laughs> uh, which uh, is about um, uh, female sexuality and body uh, in different di in discourses uh, on female sexuality and body uh, in different Polish Jewish texts. Uh, because um, during my previous research, I found out that uh, Polish Jewish literature written by women was often focused on the women's question. And then I started to think whether we can trace the same interest in other documents and especially memoirs and diaries and correspondence between uh, the writers and not only writers. So my current project is about this uh, non-literary sources. Um, okay, <laughs> so um, I'm going to uh, share screen and have a small presentation. No problem, you can share so it. I hope you will see it. Okay, do you see? Yeah, we do, yes. Okay, good. Um, so first of all, I am going to talk about this uh, reflection on female body uh, in some Ege documents that I found out. Unfortunately, my project started in February last year. So pandemic has a great impact on it. Uh, but hopefully, maybe I will manage to finish with some good results. Um, so first, I would like to um, give you short um, basic facts, what am I really uh, doing? So first of all, the authors of uh, the memoirs are, as I said, Polish Jewish female, Polish Jewish women, but um, the, the language of expression is Polish and their identity is usually very complex, but uh, I I'll focus on those writers who are not only aware of their Jewishness, but they also somehow try to uh, show it in their text or, or their texts, uh, like literary texts, are devoted to Jewish questions. Uh, and in memoirs, I also try to find those who write about their Jewish background. Um, the majority of them come from Galicia or the Kingdom of Poland. It's uh, quite obvious that the Prussia uh, partition, uh, due to political reasons, had different, um, uh, different political situations. So many Jews, if they uh, were acculturating, they were rather do, doing that to German culture, not the Polish one. And they are usually middle class uh, women. Mostly they worked as teachers because uh, those who were writers or journalists, uh, they couldn't make their ends meet uh, just from their salary as, as journalists or, or, or the writers. 
Um, and it's a very small group, so it's not very representative, probably. Um, okay, and um, the type of documents I am now dealing with are um, diaries, and here I have so far only one, a very sh short one, but very interesting uh, as well, because uh, it's, um, uh, do you see, uh, do you see my presentation? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Sorry, because I had some problems. Okay. Uh, it's a diary uh, by Helena uh, Spitbaum, uh, who wrote it when she was 15. So for my research, it's a very interesting one, because as you know, uh, time of adolescence is very often uh, focused on body uh, and on the changes of the body. So I was uh, hoping to find there some reflection on, uh, on body. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this wasn't the case. And then I have some memoirs, which were mostly written after the Second World War, which is also important uh, context of them. And there is some correspondence, um, usually between Polish writers like Gabriela Zapolska or Eliza Orzeszkowa, with uh, some of uh, members of the Polish Jewish uh, circles, uh, like Aniela Kongutówna, she was a playwright and a novelist and a journalist. And uh, she was a friend of Gabriela Zapolska. So here I have some private correspondence between them. And um, there is also private correspondence between Eliza Orzeszkowa and Jadwiga Nuzbaumówna, who was um, a student of Orzeszkowa because Orzeszkowa uh, couldn't uh, um, make her ends meet only on their uh, on her um, writings and only on on her household. She she had a farm, so she um, invited some of the middle class young girls to a kind of a of Pensia to a kind of, of a college for them. And Jadwika Nuzbaumówna was one of her students and they were very um, close to each other. And then there is a professional correspondence between, uh, for example, again, Eliza Orzeszkowa and Malvina Bloomberg, who uh, contributed in Orzeszkowa's recognition, recognition overseas because she was her translator. And she also encouraged Orzeszkowa to get more uh, engaged uh, in the fight for uh, women's rights. And uh, she translated her um, quite famous speech to German women and also um, encouraged her to write a similar one to French and English women. And, uh, and there is again a correspondence between Eliza Orzeszkowa and Daniela Korngutówna, uh, but it's mostly about the literary work of, of Korngutówna. So my first challenge with the correspondence is that there are not so many letters from this Polish Jewish milieu. And, and the question is whether uh, they didn't survive for uh, obvious reason because of the Second World War, or uh, maybe because uh, they were uh, written by not uh, so well-known and recognized figures, uh, they weren't uh, valuable for, for the archi uh, archivists and and they didn't survive. But on the other hand, they also show how this Polish Jewish uh, milieu of acculturating Jews mingled with Polish allies and how they tried to be a part of a, um, of a Polish intelligentsia as well. Um, and then I would like you to go to some uh, closer to, um, to some 
uh, memoirs that I have. And, um, and one of them is very interesting. Uh, it's by Clara Mirska. And there are three versions of this text. One is a book, published book. Uh, it was published in 1980. And it was entitled In the Shadow of a Great Fear. Another is uh, the one that you can see on your screens uh, is a typed manuscript. And there is also a handwritten manuscript. And in that manuscript, she crossed out, for example, parts uh, when she was writing about the changes uh, of her body and her attitude towards her body when she was uh, 15 uh, and um, uh, and she when she was 15 she she was uh, in school and uh, she fell in love with one of her teachers and uh, th this whole uh, love story is uh, included in the book version and in the in the typed manuscript but uh, but uh, fragments when she describes her, her um, attitude towards her body were crossed out, which I think is, um, uh, well, it's interesting and it's important also for my, uh, for my project. And um, here we have um, a short uh, fragment when she uh, describes her first sexual experience. Uh, and it's a rare thing um, in, in the memoirs because in all other memoirs that I found so far, um, there are no traces of any, uh, any uh, experiences that these women had after getting married, for example, uh, or uh, like in the case of Helena Spiedbaum, uh, there's no mentioning of her body and the way she feels about it. So um, my question and the challenge that I have is whether um, it is because these uh, things were not important um, for, for the authors, or maybe it's uh, uh, it's a visualization of of the context of the epoch, because at the beginning of the twentieth century, uh, in the Kingdom of Poland, but also in Galicia, but mostly in the Kingdom of Poland, there was a huge debate uh, on sexual education, and of course on prostitution, because everything uh, was. Uh, related to women's emancipation as well. And uh, many um, physicians and social activists uh, pointed out that young women do not know anything about their own sexuality because they uh, are not taught it in, uh, in schools and their parents also do not want to give them uh, this knowledge. So, uh, they either don't know anything and then they get married and then they encounter a kind of a shock or they got to know something from the servants. And Clara Milska case uh, um, is, all, is, is the one like that. Uh, she, uh, her servant uh, gives her some literature and also tells her uh, some details about the sec women's sexuality. Anyways, um, this fragment, uh, when she writes that um, her loved one uh, suddenly pulled uh, her closer to him and he started passionately kissing my bosoms and then he said, oh, how beautiful they are, how beautiful. And he was repeating as in ecstasy and I succumbed passively, she writes. I did make not a single move. I did say not a single word. I didn't mean to hurt him. Uh, and then she, she continues, says, and, uh, and after all, he realizes that she is not interested, that she is not responding. So he got colder uh, as well. 
And um, maybe she uh, was very much interesting uh, in her physicality because one of the first sentences of her uh, of her memoir is that her parents were beautiful and she wasn't and she definitely ha had problems with her own body and acceptance of her body. But uh, the fact that she writes it in the 1960s may also play a role here because as we all know, uh, she writes it after the sexual revolution and uh, of course in communist Poland, uh, the sexual revolution uh, was much different than in, in Western Europe, but still uh, I wonder whether the fact that she wrote it so many years um, after the war um, might be the reason why she pays so much attention uh, to sexuality. And uh, she often repeats that she was passive and that was the reason why her uh, marriage was unhappy. And that was the reason why uh, her husband found a lover. So, um, so this is um, this is one of the um, of the questions that I have to answer. And I also would like you to show a very special piece of document. Uh, it's not a memoir, even though it is called like that but it's rather a study on people, on clients of a masseur who worked uh, in Warsaw between uh, late 1890s and early 1900s. And um, actually I decided to, um, to, um, to talk to you about the challenges and the opportunities of the ego documents uh, that I found, uh, mostly because of this piece of document, because I worked on it with uh, colleagues who are uh, Polish philologists and who are uh, historians of Polish women. And by working with them, I realized how important and how um, uh, influencing in our interpretation is uh, the, uh, our background, our um, uh, scientific interests. Uh, because um, here, here I want you to, um, to show two fragments when she writes about uh, Jewish uh, uh, people in, in Warsaw. So she writes, just after my arrival to Warsaw, I went to her a friend of her, but seeing on the tenants list her father, Abram Factor, and Factor is not a surname, it's a pseudonym probably, because she never uses any surnames in her, uh, in her work, the middleman, and um, the thought that I would come to people who are so low on the social ladder, even though six of his sons graduated from university, who would offend me with their speech and movements, my hand hesitated and didn't have courage to touch the knob and enter a house of people who were not equal to me, neither from my class nor from my background. This is a first one. As, and as you can see, these are very um, characteristic anti-Semitic cliches like the fact the, that they would have uh, some special movements and the speech. So it's not the Polish one, but uh, the, the one with the Jewish accent. And then another uh, fragment when she writes, just after publication of my advert, I was called to miss uh, her name ending on Berg was terrifying. I knew Jews only from novels and short stories. And when you read it, you can think that she was an anti-Semite or you can think that she was uh, influenced by the stereotypes. But then, um, because um, her memoir is, uh, introduced by a small um, factograph, uh, biographical information from her great grandson, uh, it changes everything because she was a, a Jew. She was, uh, she was Jewish. 
So uh, when I was working with my colleagues, uh, they didn't perceive uh, uh, her as Jewish. And uh, that's why many of fragments of her diary had different, uh, um, um, uh, had different uh, influence in them and they, they, they interpreted it differently. And, uh, and the fact that she was a uh, Jew changes also these few anti-Semitic uh, uh, passages that she, that she wrote. So to sum up, the conclusions are here like that, that the challenges that I have is the potential overinterpretation because maybe the fact that I uh, am focused on, on Jewishness may change my interpretation and I might be I might go too far like in the in the last case uh, because maybe the author didn't want to be uh, to be uh, identified as Jew. Uh, and then the lack of context uh, of the epoch also changes our interpretation. And the fact that we are never innocent while reading uh, ego documents or any kind of documents is also very important, I think. But then we have also uh, ego documents give us also many opportunities because they show a broader picture, like we can see how two cultures mingled with themselves, I mean, Polish and, uh, and Jewish, for example. And the micro histories tells us uh, a totally different story, which is still um, might be very interesting. And then some social and cultural contexts may be also helpful in our interpretation. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, I think that your talk was very interesting, uh, but uh, I would like you to take two bibliographical notes. Uh, one is a, a very new book by Rachel Mankin. Ah, uh, yes, about, of course, I know it. Yeah, yeah. and, and she, she also refers to, for example, to Sarah Schneider. Sarah yeah. Schneider was a very famous uh, creator of Betsy Yaakov, the school for girls. She wrote, Two diaries. Yeah, in Polish. One of them in Polish and one of them in Hebrew. And Darius even referred to it in, in a talk about her book. So you, you could look at it uh, from another perspective because she brings up a few uh, young women coming to the big city and, and getting into university. And, and uh, this is a special social group within Jews. The second uh, point I want to make is regarding the last case that you brought us. Where did she come from, Yetviga? Uh, she came from Piotrkov, Trybunalski. Okay. Because there is a clash within Jews in Poland between what called, what's called Galician Jews and Lithuanian Jews. And this could be a projection of this. In many cases, you find uh, Lithuanian Jews referring to Galician Jews in very much with anti-Semitic uh, manner. Mm -hmm. So it, it could be that this is where it comes from. So you, you, if you go into it, because Piotrowska is, 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 a, is a part of Lithuania, part of Belarus. So it's, 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 you, could see, uh, uh, you could see this. Just look into it and it might explain a few things, mm -hmm. not only. Uh, and uh, the literature of it, but also the, uh, but very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I, I think we'll have a break uh, for about 10, 15 minutes. Anybody interested to, 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 to talk with each other, I'll stop the recording and begin it later. So feel free to talk to each other.